Okay, I think uh, we'll get started. So it's a, a great pleasure to introduce a friend and colleague, Dr. Clive Brayman from the University of Bergen. Contrary to one of the emails I sent out that said he was from the University of Oslo, he's not. <laughs> he's from the University of Bergen. Somehow I got those Norwegian cities mixed together. I apologize. Um, Clive, actually, fortunately for us, is here doing a, a bit of a sabbatical in the state of Virginia, working at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Janelia campus in Ashburn. And so we have the good fortune of having him take a little, little side trip down from Ashburn to Roanoke and visit with us for a couple days and, and give a talk. Um, Clive uh, is, as it says there, the professor and head of neuroscience in the Department of Biomedicine at the University of Bergen. By way of background, uh, he did his undergraduate work uh, at Penn State here in the United States. Uh, and uh, then went on to uh, make his, what was going to be long-lasting connections to Norway, where he did his medical degree at the University of Bergen. And after completing his medical degree, he went on to do a PhD there in physiology, uh, working uh, in a variety of labs with Dr. Srebro, but also had a very tight connection at that time to work with uh, Tim Bliss uh, at the Medical Research Council in England, who many of you know from the uh, famous studies on uh, LTP and uh, so-called long-term potentiation. <clears throat> and he also had a very uh, tight working relationship with another very famous neuroscientist in uh, Norway, Ola Petter Ottesen, who's now at the Karolinska Institute. See that, Brad? Blinked. Okay. Um, anyway, so he's worked with a, a lot of terrific people and went on from there, spent some time at NIH, both at NINDS and at NIMH, uh, worked with uh, Daniel Alcon uh, at NIH, some of the early days of using SLICE brain slice physiology to study uh, plasticity and function and physiology. Um, and then he spent some more time uh, in uh, D.C. working with John Sarvey in the Department of Pharmacology at the University uh, of uh, Uniformed Health Services. And from there, <clears throat> did go back to Bergen to join the faculty where he became an associate professor uh, in physiology initially, and then in the early 2000s was appointed as the head and professor uh, of neuroscience in the Department of Biomedicine at the University of Bergen. In addition to Clive's scientific work, he's extremely active and highly recognized across the European continent for his leadership uh, responsibilities that are many. <clears throat> he's serving as the president of the Norwegian Neuroscience Society now. Uh, he's a board member of the International Brain Research Organization and a board member of the Norwegian Brain Council. He also co-founded the International Graduate School of Integrative Neuroscience. Uh, he serves as an editor and associate editor in numerous journals, including Frontiers in Behavioral Neuroscience. He's the section editor for Molecular and Cellular Neuroscience for the European Journal of Neuroscience. Uh, so he's currently doing this sabbatical, partly up at HHMI, but has been some, spent some time at Stanford as well. He's on some sort of a great double <laughs> mini sabbatical going great places. Uh, but in particular, uh, Clive's work, I think, has been uh, instrumental in our appreciation of understanding certain aspects of signaling pathways and neurotrophins uh, and underlying signaling pathways within cells in, in plasticity. For example, his uh, early work on brain-derived neurotrophic factor uh, and studying transcriptional and translational dependent plasticity in the mature brain uh, was some of the really critical work in that field leading us to understand the signaling pathways of ERK and MEK and how dendritic messenger RNAs were involved in plasticity, particularly one that I think we'll hear a bit about today, ARC, uh, as kind of a master regulator and effector of synaptic plasticity. And recently, his study of this immediate early gene product, uh, uh, looking at ARC, has shown some fascinating uh, aspects of this in terms of its ability to self-assemble into a retrovirus-like capsid and deliver RNA between cells. I, in my opinion, this work is some of the most innovative going on in cellular and molecular neuroscience in opening up exciting new vistas. Uh, lastly, it wouldn't be fair for me to just introduce Clive without saying that his early work uh, was involved as a herpetologist studying osmoregulation <laughs> in lizards in the Keys in Florida. So he's a well-rounded scientist. Clive, welcome. Thank you so much. It's really wonderful to be here. Thanks, Mike, for a great introduction. Um, yeah, so I, I'm from Pittsburgh originally, and I'm on sabbatical here now, and I have to say it, it's just a, simply a pleasure to wake up every morning and, and to be able to say, I'm here, I'm here in the U.S. It's really wonderful. And it's good to be here with my, with my friends from Virginia. We have uh, really established strong ties. Um, okay, so my lab is trying to understand the molecular basis for information storage 
uh, in the nervous system. Because ultimately, the, 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 the information um, that is encoded is encoded at the molecular level and then it's read out at the, at the, at the cellular network level and behavioral level. Um, and the immediate, the immediate early gene product ARC is, being, is recognized as a key player uh, in the process of, of information storage. And you'll see that um, the field is now reached a very exciting uh, stage um, in which we're beginning to understand how, for the first time, how the ARC protein itself works. And it appears um, that, uh, that the ARC protein has viral-like properties and can be, actually behave like a virus in transmitting RNAs. So I'll get back to that. Um, so this scheme uh, shows the, the various levels of organization involved in the processing and storage of information. Um, a young girl reading a book, it, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Committing these lines to memory, the different regions of the brain involved, the circuitry, the antiviral hippocampal circuitry, cell types, glia, uh, neurons, transmission at the synapse, the excitability changes, and then regulation of gene expression, transcription, and protein synthesis. And that we know that for, for long-term uh, storage of information, um, the regulation of gene expression uh, is, is important. And that's where art comes in. So if one looks at an excitatory synapse, um, they display a, a great diversity, many different kinds of plasticity. So generically, we refer to an, an enhancement, a long-term enhancement as long-term potentiation and a long-term um, decrease in synaptic efficacy as long-term depression. But this varies depending on the, the mechanism, depends on the synaptic input to the cell uh, and the cell type. Um, we know that the abundance of glutamate receptors, of amper-type glutamate receptors uh, at the postsynaptic membrane is a major determinant uh, of synaptic strength, and that the, the uh, long-term morphological changes, spine growth, spine shrinkage, and so forth, depend on active and cytoskeletal dynamics um, and uh, de novo protein synthesis. And again, ARC is involved in, in all of these aspects of synaptic regulation and, and plasticity. Um, so if we look at this sort of textbook scheme of what happens to um, upon transcription, one can see we have we've worked on various stages of, of, of this process um, and really our focus now, uh, most of the lab, on trying to understand how the uh, ARC protein is working and how the activity uh, is being regulated and what it does. Uh, so historically, we've, we've worked on brain-derived neurotrophic factor um, as, a, as a trigger and in some context for a stable synaptic change, the regulation of dendritic protein synthesis, and then the ARC as, a, as an effector. So we know that if we block ARC synthesis, we block the, this plasticity response to BDNF uh, in the brain in vivo. So um, to sort of characterize what, what is ARC, um, it is highly dynamic uh, from the level of transcriptional regulation to RNA transport to the um, uh, the function of the protein. So the polymerase is stalled uh, at the start site, um, allowing production of, of, of nascent mRNA within a few minutes, very rapid uh, RNA transport to dendrites. The protein is synthesized in dendrites and in the cell body. Um, so the RNA, upon translation, undergoes a rapid degradation, and the protein is also rapid in, in how it works. So it's, it's made, and then it does its thing, uh, involved in, in long-term potentiation or involved in, in long-term depression, and then undergoes a rapid degradation. So that's its basic modus operandi, is that of a highly dynamic system with rapid turnover. RNA and, and, the, and the protein are rapidly turned over. And uh, of course, ARC is uh, known to be critical not for, the, for learning, but for long-term memory formation. Okay. 
And so just to, to, uh, to go, go back a few years and show uh, just one slide from this paper in 2007 that gives you an idea of, uh, of arc dynamics. Um, here we've induced LTP. This is all in the live animal. It's a nesotized rat. We're stimulating the medial perforant path input to the dentate gyrus. And we've infused arc antisense to block the translation of arc messenger RNA. And when we infuse the, the, uh, the antisense at two hours, we see a rapid and complete reversion of the LTP. Infuse at four hours, there's no effect. So in this time window, uh, arc is acting. And we can see that, that the, if we monitor um, by Western blot or by immunohistochemistry, we can see the, a loss, a 50% reduction of the ARC protein during this, this phase of, the, uh, of, of LTP um, inhibition. So the ARC protein is highly dynamic, it's acting rapidly. So uh, the question really is, what is, what is ARC? How does it work? Um, ARC has commonly, be, commonly been used as a, one of the IEGs to monitor activity-dependent neuronal activity. Um, but one often, we often get the question, what, is, what actually is ARC? How does it work? So we're trying to get at that. And the, most of the talk will focus on, on that issue. And then in the final series of slides, I'd like to show uh, you our latest um, progress in putting the ARC protein under optical control. So um, ARC, ARC is a dynamic and interactive hub protein inside the neuron. Um, that's probably, that is uh, one, one of its major modes of action. So the, the ARC protein uh, has um, a number of direct binding partners. Um, so this is a curated protein interaction network uh, based on, on low throughput assays. And these are some of the, uh, of the known ARC binding partners. Some of them are very well defined, others not, not so much. Um, but if one, one can then, based on this interaction network, make a scheme of the, uh, the ARC protein binding partners that mediate the effector pathways um, in plasticity. So actin regulators involved in uh, control of uh, F-actin stability and um, spine plasticity. ARC is well known to uh, be involved in, uh, in recruiting the machinery for clathrin-mediated endocytosis and promoting the internalization of uh, AMPA receptors and synaptic long-term depression and homeostatic scaling. And a lot of ARC uh, ends up in the nucleus, and the roles of ARC in the nucleus are beginning to emerge. Um, and it has then distinct binding partners within the nucleus. So ARC is rapidly induced and is able to interact with distinct binding partners in, in dendrites or in the spine, as well as in the, nuclei, in the nucleus to mediate effects on synaptic plasticity. Although how this is organized, how it works, is not very well known. But it appears to be a master organizer of plasticity inside the neuron. And, um, and so we're interested in trying to understand how, how is that organized? How does ARC mediate both uh, LTP and LTD? Um, are, is, it, does it, is it a question of regulation of the protein interactions uh, through a post translational modification? Or could there be a possibly an effect on the ligomeric state? And really nothing was known about the ligomeric states of the ARC protein. So when we started to get into this back in, in 2010, this is a figure from a review, um, we didn't, really didn't know anything about you know, the shape of ARC. What does it look like? There's nothing tangible. So we have basically a stick model, um, a couple of, of uh, binding site determinants um, were known, but uh, ARC is not a transcription factor, has no known DNA RNA binding motifs, it's not an enzyme, uh, doesn't have an EF hand, no known calcium binding motifs. So this all, all fits with the, the picture now of ARC as, a, as an interactive hub protein, as an adapter. Uh, and that's how it's working. Um, and so to sort of pick up on, uh, to pick up and try to, to look at the structure of the ARC protein itself, we teamed up with uh, protein biochemist Aurora Martinez and Craig Meyer, a PhD student in the lab, he led this work. And he, he was able to purify ARC in high concentrations for the first time. We had hopes of getting the crystal structure. We didn't at that time. Um, but he was able to carry, carry out a series of biochemical, uh, physical chemical analyses of the ARC protein and to image the ARC protein, um, the recombinant human ARC protein. And um, uh, basically uh, what Craig was able to, to show is by partial triptych digestion of mass spec, 
it was able to, to, uh, to define domains of the ARC protein. So it has two, two major domains uh, uh, separated by a flexible linker region. The whole ARC protein is sort of loosey-goosey in its structure, so a high degree of tertiary flexibility. It has a highly basic N-terminal domain and an acidic C-terminal domain. Um, and uh, the other feature was that ARC oligomerizes. Now, one of the reasons this is 20, 20 years after ARC was cloned by, by the Worley lab and Dietmar Kuhl labs independently, and there was no structural information. And that is because ARC has a strong tendency to, to aggregate. So um, uh, Craig was able to, to purify ARC and show that it, that it, that it undergoes an orderly and, and highly reversible oligomerization. So I'll just show you some of the, some of the data from that. So here's basically um, the position of these domains, and they have different properties in terms of the thermal stability and so forth. They have a highly basic N-terminal and an acidic C-terminal domain and uh, a loose tertiary structure. Um, so what he was able to show was that, that ARC undergoes this reversible ligamerization. Um, when the recombinant protein is in, is in water or in, at low ionic strength, we can see a monomer, so the sizes based on dynamic light scattering, which is a, an excellent tool for looking at the ligamerization biochemically. We can see then a 5.7 nanometer um, size, which corresponds to the non-modified uh, human ARC protein at about 48 kD. And this may be an elongated monomer or a dimer, this, uh, this peak here. Now, uh, when these temperature scans are done, so you have the, the protein and then you just gradually increase the temperature, um, we're able to see then the, the formation of the oligomeric state, a high order oligomeric state, and it can be reversed down and taken back to the monomeric state and you can redo it, redo it at a different temperature. So it appears to be an orderly uh, oligomerization process, which suggested that might be important for the function. Um, so we then put the recombinant protein um, uh, under the electron microscope. And uh, you know, at this stage, we are, we, are really, we are really sort of focused on showing that we can see the low order oligomers or maybe the monomers. Uh, so in water, which was a great condition for, for getting the monomeric form of arc and avoiding the oligomerization, um, we couldn't actually see it. It was just too, too small. Um, but with, under salt conditions, we began to see these particles. And here you can see um, now with, the, with uh, potassium chloride added, that we get these irregular oligomeric particles of about, of about 30 nanometers in diameter. Didn't suggest anything in particular, um, just that we had a, 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 an irregular amorphous oligomeric state uh, of the protein. Um, and then uh, by atomic force microscopy, we were also able to, to visualize and see the surface, get an idea of the dimension and see the surface of the protein. Um, and the size of these particles, this particle here, is also about 30 nanometers. Now, we'll, as we'll see, that this may correspond to the, to the, uh, the size of the retroviral type capsids that were discovered by Jason Shepard and Vivian Budnick. Okay. So, um, so back, in 2000, in, back in 2015, we already knew about this computational work uh, suggesting that, that ARC had ancient retroviral origins, um, that, but that the retroviral family of GAG proteins um, and ARC and several other proteins um, uh, were are domesticated forms of a TI3 uh, retrotransposon. And uh, this was way back in 2006, and no one had really done anything about this in terms of going into the biology of it. And I think perhaps because it was a bit hard to, to reconcile and, to, and really to come to grips with. Um, a beautiful study by Paul, from Paul Worley's lab uh, in 2015, that same year that we published our paper, they were able to, to show that the C-terminal domain has um, stunning 3D homology with um, the HIV gag capsid protein and, and, and specifically the C lobe, the, the, the capsid CTD or the C lobe of the capsid protein. So it has an N and a C lobe and they're both homologous to the C lobe of the HIV. 
and not, and not only uh, that, the, that this end lobe on the, on the side of it here, the end terminal side, it has this nice hydrophobic binding pocket. And that's how they were able to crystallize this, this, this one piece here, the end lobe, using stargazing, which is an auxiliary subunit of the AMPA receptor. Um, okay, so it suggested that the end lobe had, had, had evolved a specialized property that's not present in the virus of interacting uh, with proteins and then could play a role in, in arc signaling. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this was only the, the CTD, and it was in two pieces. And we wanted to get an idea. Uh, we wanted to see the whole protein, and we weren't able to, to crystallize it. And so uh, we decided to, to try to um, get the structure using small angle X-ray scattering. And this was work by postdoc Eric Halin in, uh, in, in the lab my collaborator, Professor Petri Kurselenbergen. Um, and to do this, uh, his task was to, to purify a monomeric human art, so it could be used then in the, in the uh, yeah, for synchrotron and, and, and the beam analysis for uh, X-ray scattering. And he was able to do this by, by increasing the pH. Um, and uh, as was shown later in the paper, this, re this results in a partial unfolding of the N-terminal domain, uh, which is involved in binding ARC to the membrane. So when the pH is lowered to, to, to back to neutrality, back to 7, we still see this, this nice monomeric peak, and, and it retains uh, this, its monomeric state for long enough that we can do these studies and do the X-ray scattering. Um, this is a recombinant um, uh, human protein. And, uh, and here we're now looking at the rat hippocampal tissue. And you can see just looking at the lysate, and doing an arc western blot, so at neutral pH is very little arc. At uh, pH 12, we now get the same amount of arc, same solubility that you would see um, when the samples are treated with detergent, uh, SDS. Okay. So um, this, this, this shows really our, our approach in making various truncations of these, uh, these critical regions of, of the arc protein, and then running the SACS analysis. And we can see that, that um, all, all of these pieces here, without this NTD region, they're all beautifully monomeric, beautiful Sachs peaks, but not with the full-length protein where the NTD is present. Um, and uh, let me see. So I won't go into these really specifics on the Sachs. I'll just give you an overview of... Um, the results based on, uh, on SACS and synchrotron radiation, circular dichroism analysis, and homology modeling. I'll just spin it around. So in addition to the, the CTD domains, um, the evidence from the, the SACS analysis uh, indicates the presence of a an elongated uh, alpha helix, an anti-parallel coil-coil in the N-terminal domain. And this piece of the protein is involved in binding arc um, to the phospholipid membrane. So in addition to making the uh, recombinant protein, we, made, uh, uh, we looked at the, uh, the structural aspects uh, of ARC uh, using FRET, both ratiometric FRET and FLIM FRET, for instance, lifetime imaging FRET. So you c we're using some of, the, uh, some of the same pieces and then simply m doing initial FRET looking at, at the end-to-end -end, um, sizes. And the results from this where we express the, the ARC protein in um, C1 neurons of aganotepic hippoc hippocampal slices either by single cell electroporation or by gene gunning in, um, very much fit with the, with the SACS data. So you can see that if we look at this first end uh, terminal piece where we have the anti-parallel coil coil, um, that the, 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 the FRET data um, indicates a, a, a very strong FRET signal, which is then consistent with the proximity of the donor acceptor pairs on either end uh, of this coil coil. 
Um, so uh, we also looked at peptide ligand binding inside, inside the coil. Um, the thinking was that when the peptide binds, that we might see a conformational change. Because one of the things that we're working on um, is to try to develop a FET biosensor for ARC based on the conformational change. But um, we didn't see any uh, major effects. So when the peptide binds, there is a change in secondary structure, which could be due to changes in the, in the, in the beta sheet of this, of this end lobe. The data is consistent with that. But there's no major structural rearrangement of the protein. Um, we're also using ITC. Able, we're able to estimate the, um, the KDs, the binding affinities uh, of the peptides. And we found that stargazin of the, has the highest, uh, of the highest binding affinity. So we did not see uh, any interaction of ARC with, with glue N2A that was reported by the Worley lab. OK. And so um, we then looked at the ARC protein interaction with the membrane and found that this, the NTD is necessary for that. In these studies, we've done a co-sedimentation assay with liposomes. And we varied the, the, um, the, the phospholipid components of the liposome. And the data suggests that the NTD is involved, that the basic region of the NTD is, uh, interacts with the charged head groups of membrane fossil lipids. So you can see that the full length, that the full length arc uh, is pellenting out um, in the membrane fraction. And, and this, this binding of this interaction is uh, abolished when phosphate um, is added to the solution. And then these other fragments simply don't show membrane binding at all. So just to, to, um, to re recapitulate some of these uh, salient features from the full-length ARC protein, one thing that I forgot to mention is that the, uh, what happens is, is that SACS is, SACS is showing a compact um, structure to the full-length ARC protein, where the, uh, the, 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 the basic NTD and the acidic NTD oppositely charged domains are interacting. And this is stabilizing the flexible linker. So when the peptide binds, there doesn't seem to be much change in the flexibility of the linker region under these conditions where we have a monodisperse you know, arc in solution. Um, and then we think a really important finding from this is the, uh, the evidence for this uh, elongated anti-parallel coil-coil uh, in the NTD. Um, so uh, in January of last year, two really game-changing papers appeared uh, in, in Cell, uh, one from the Jason Shepard lab and other from the, from the lab of Vivian Budnick and Travis Thompson at, at uh, UMass Med in Worcester. Um, so rat, fly, and um, they are saying that, that uh, ARC not only has a, a, a domain that, um, with homology, to, to, to gag. Um, but the, the ARC protein itself assembles into oligomers and assembles into these structures that, that look like viruses and are able to capture RNA and to deliver the RNA uh, to, to the outside and to neighboring cells via extracellular vesicles. Um, and so here is a, a negative stain uh, image, a classical work on HIV-1 uh, gag particles from 1999. And you can see that the circular, the circular structures. Um, and then in Jason's lab, they were able to, when they purified rat arc and put it on the electron microscope using a phosphate buffer, um, they were able to see very similar uh, sorts of structures that suggested to them that maybe arc is actually behaving as a virus. And a similar situation in the fly, they really came at it from a, a different perspective in their lab, uh, studying the, the uh, neuromuscular junction of the fly. But they also, when they look at the recombinant protein, see this virus type of structures. And then uh, in the fly work, they're able to, to look at the endogenous capsid as well by taking the extracellular vesicles, lysing them, and then doing immunogold staining um, for DARC1, the Drosophila ARC1. And so these papers are suggesting something uh, radically new about ARC, um, and that is that it can assemble uh, into these, these capsids um, and that they, they do contain ARC RNA and perhaps, perhaps other cargo and are able to transmit the RNA to some neighboring cells. 
So a lot of the physiology and function isn't well known um, at this point. But the evidence from the fly suggests that the transmission uh, of arc RNA by these capsids is necessary for plasticity at the neuromuscular junction, both developmental and then a more mature, heavy and type of plasticity at the neuromuscular junction. Okay, and so, uh, so we have this, uh, this dichotomy, if you will, between ARC as a dynamic signaling protein um, with multiple interaction partners inside the neuron, rapidly turned over, versus the formation of this capsids. And this is just a, a cartoon uh, based on uh, the, the monomeric structure of ARC of how it might assemble into a capsid via domain swapping in which this linker region would become extended and would give flexibility uh, to, the, to the outside. But the point is, what is the relationship between these two and how do we, how do we study these capsids? And so um, enter PhD student uh, Maria Erickson. She got her PhD actually last fall. So her project was to try to understand uh, the, the control of arc oligomerization. And then when the capsid work came out, we also wanted to look uh, at, at these capsids as well. And uh, so the starting off point was a really stringent, biochemically stringent affinity purification in hex cells. But she expressed ARC that was fused N terminally to, to a GFP variant, M turquoise 2, and then another uh, ARC with, containing the strep tag. Um, and then she would um, uh, express the full length ARC and different fragments of ARC and then use immunostating to detect the, the arc arc uh, interaction, so the presence of that interaction, uh, the presence of the oligomer. And um, yeah, so then she, she did this, she, she characterized this uh, using the uh, different pieces of, of the arc protein. Um, and uh, arc has three cysteines, which could potentially form spurious or oligomers or artifacts. A mutation of, uh, has five cysteines. The mutations of all these cysteines didn't have any impact um, on the oligomerization. So it does not involve spurious disulfide bond formation. And she was able to show that it's this second coil from 78 to 140 um, that is uh, involved uh, in the arc oligomerization. So it's just a Western blot showing, giving you an idea of the data, what it looks like, the levels of expression. We won't go into that right now. Um, and I'll just show you some of the conclusions and a bit of data on this. Yeah, so she went into the, into the second coil and then um, tried to find the uh, stretches within that coil important for the oligomerization. She did first a deletional analysis using overlap, overlapping, um, uh, overlapping sections, overlapping pieces, and then went on to do a, an alanine scanning based on mutation of successive seven amino acid alan alanine stretches uh, in the second coil. And uh, what she was able to show is that there's this piece of approximately 33 amino acids um, that uh, is necessary and sufficient uh, for arc and ligamerization. Um, and then with the alanine scanning, she identified a, a bit of a sweet spot located right in the middle here that is necessary for the ligamerization of, of, of uh, full length arc. It's located in the middle of the second coil. Um, and uh, this shows the, the, uh, some of the, the purification data where the mutation is made in this 113 to 119 um, segment of the full length arc protein. And that blocks then the detection of the arc arc uh, interaction. She also did a, um, use a peptide array, which she makes a GC diffusion of the arc 78 to 140, so the entire length of the NTD second coil, and then um, has this various uh, um, and then looks at interaction with the uh, arc peptides uh, and is able to show, you get very similar data uh, showing the interaction with this region of, of 99 up to about one, 132 high affinity interaction. Um, and then uh, when the, this, this uh, peptide, which we call the oligomerization region or oligomerization domain, if we isolate it, and, and if you make it synthetically, so there's no cellular factors, HPC, HPLC purified, we show that it indeed has a very strong oligomerization tendency. And it forms a hexamer with beautiful P2 symmetry based on the Sachs analysis. So the synchrotron Sachs analysis 
and the, the, the CD spectra and the sec mouse analysis for molecular weight are very nicely corresponding. So it, uh, it has a, a strong oligomeric tendency, this peptide. It doesn't mean the full length protein is forming a hexamer working the same way, but the peptide has that nature. Um, and then we also did the, the flim fret imaging uh, of the NTT second coil and showed that mutation of this seven amino acid region uh, does result in, a, um, in an inhibition uh, of the oligomerization. This is a positive control here in which you have a GFP M cherry fusion. Um, and then the, the wild type second coil is right at the same level. And that then it is uh, reduced, it's offset by the mutation, but it's not completely eliminated. So it suggests that indeed there's a persistence of an arc arc interaction upon mutation of this seven amino acid region that we've identified. Okay, so if you look then at this piece, um, this oligomeric domain, it is an amphipathic, uh, amphipathic stretch. Of course, it's in a, in a coil coil, it's not surprising. So you have hydrophilic re, uh, residues on one side and hydrophobic on the other. But something that is actually very interesting is that this is pH neutral. So the isoelectric point is neutral. Uh, and yet the NTD is, it has a PI of, of uh, 9.4. So it's surrounded by regions with, which are highly, ba patch, highly basic patches. Okay. So, um, so we wanted to, do, wanted to do several things, to know more about the oligomeric state of the ARP protein, and also to really think about uh, the assembly process. Um, and we were particularly interested in, in, interested in, in the possible role of the host RNA, uh, partly because Jason, uh, in his paper, Jason Shepard, had shown that when they added exogenous uh, GFP RNA, they were able to improve um, the, the formation of the capsids. And so we wanted to include that in, uh, in this workup. And so this just shows uh, the basic scheme of the, uh, of, uh, the uh, assembly process for HIV-1 gag, which is very much a process that happens at the plasma membrane. And um, so there, the different domains within gag enact uh, very specific roles um, that are yeah, mostly known, but it's actually still a, a hot area of research. So if you look at the GAG protein, so you have this, this capsid domain, and this, this capsid region, it will oligomerize. It will oligomerize by itself. And, and, and ARC is not doing that. We have never seen that. We've studied it by flim fret, with, the, uh, with expressing in cells and so forth, with recombinant protein. We don't see that. Um, then it has this matrix region, and this matrix region is, is uh, uh, important for transfer RNA binding. Um, it undergoes uh, mistorylation, and, and it's really important for, for targeting um, the GAG protein uh, to the membrane, getting it safely to, the, to the, uh, the highly acidic leaf, of the inner leaf of the plasma membrane where the, uh, the GAG multimerization takes place. And it has this nucleocapsid region. The nucleocapsid region it's uh, required for infectivity. It recognizes that the viral RNA, and this is a, a cis-trans cis interaction, um, um, but not only, uh, the NC region also interacts really non-specifically with the host RNA, and this is important then for the multimerization process of GAG at the membrane. So we sort of had this in mind. And uh, so if you look at ARC, um, there's a, a predicted uh, this NTD is a predicted matrix. It actually just doesn't seem to have the same sort of structural features from what we can tell so far. But it's predicted, um, there's a predicted matrix connection there. Okay, so um, first we wanted to look at, at the oligomerization because the, uh, the work on the flim fret was hinting to us that, that there's, there's more to it um, than what we had seen with the affinity purification. And so we again used hex cells, um, and we, uh, we overexpressed wild type and this, this, uh, this 113 to 119 mutant, and another mutant too, which does not affect um, the, the oligomerization. So these, and found that um, a, a clear presence uh, of a dimer uh, in the wild type, and in both of these mutants. So, which is, so, so clearly the dimerization does not involve 
um, uh, this motif uh, in the entity's second coil. However, if you look higher up, we're able to detect, it's, it's, it's uh, faint, but we're able to detect um, a higher molecular weight putative uh, trimer. And um, several, in, in, in work by several members of the lab done independently, they're able to show that this mutation is inhibiting uh, the formation of, of this trimer, suggesting that the motif could be involved then not in dimer formation, but in higher order oligomerization of ARC. Um, so to address that question, we teamed up with uh, Meg Stratton at UMass, uh, UMass Amherst uh, to do single molecule photobleaching turf microscopy. So again, this is, this is in vitro um, using the recombinant rat protein um, in which there is a SNAP tag at the M terminus and then an AV tag for biotinylation at the C terminus. So this is on, on glass cover slip which are coated with, with PEG um, and the, the recombinant protein um, is deposited and then uh, biotinylated and it interacts then uh, with, the, with the substrate. And a, a SNAP ligand, a SNAP Alexa 488 is added um, at which point the photo bleaching can start. And then when you start to look at, at these cover slips, you see then um, these the fluorescent um, particles of, of various sizes. And as the photo bleaching is carried out, uh, one can then go back and, and then see this, this step transition as individual arc molecules photo bleach. And this, allows, this allowed um, Meg's group to, to quantify the, the number of arc molecules that are present uh, and in each of these spots. Okay. And she then looked at, did this in the wild type, and looked at the effect of adding the GFP uh, RNA. And was able to show um, that the, 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 the addition of GFP RNA strongly promotes the formation of high order oligomers, which is classified as containing between 30 and 170 arc molecules. So if you just look at this panel E here, at the high order oligomers, you can see that in the wild type, there are uh, only a few. Each dot represents the detection of one of them. And then with, with GFP RNA, you get a tremendous increase uh, in the, the occurrence of these high order oligomers. And then now in the mutant, there are hardly, hardly any, um, and there's no effect whatsoever of the GFP RNA. And the same effect can be seen at the level of the low order oligomers. So the wild type has on average a, a, a size of a, a, of a, a, a dimer. Um, the addition of GFP RNA uh, steps this up then to, to a, an arc tetramer. Um, so the, this motif, uh, in the second coil uh, is involved in, uh, in high order oligomerization of ARC and it is RNA sensitive, it's promoted by the GFP RNA. Um, so at that point we wanted to go back and, and again do these experiments um, under the electron microscope. This was with, with Jose Maria Valpuesta uh, in Madrid. So there's the, the image from the 2015 paper. And now using, using phosphate buffer, we're able to, to detect the, the, uh, the capsid particles. Um, and this is, this is improved somewhat by the addition of GFP RNA, so that agrees with the, uh, the Pasteurzen et al. Uh, work uh, as well. Um, and then with gel filtration, we're able to get, basically to purify them a, a, a bit better. But it's still a, 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 um, a mixture of high order oligomeric particles um, and the capsids themselves. Okay, so uh, in the mutant, we see a dimer. So we did the gel purification and then uh, a dynamic light scattering of the, of the wild type uh, arc protein, uh, uh, capsid purified, if you will, and the mutant protein. So the mutant protein has a diameter of uh, 14 nanometers the wild type of, of 30 nanometers. Uh, and then when sec mouse is done to give us the, the, the actual size, um, this, it corresponds very nicely to that of a dimer. And then the electron microscopy shows uh, what appears to be a homogeneous 
a dimer population um, in the mutant. Then Jose Maria did 3D uh, EM reconstruction um, based on 55,000 uh, particles and is able to, to see that that, that indeed, uh, in terms of its size and its shape, fits nicely um, with a, with a, a, a dimer. Um, and um, we believe that the most likely scenario is an interaction between the NTD of, of one arc molecule and the CTD of the other. So we think the CTD is, is likely to be involved. We're doing those experiments now. Um, yeah, we'll see. But in terms of the docking model, it fits nicely with that. OK, uh, so um, the, the field has reached a really fascinating stage. Um, and uh, we've come to know a lot, uh, but they're just generating more and more questions. We don't know uh, how, the, how ARC is acting as a, ma as a master organizer uh, in terms of its protein-protein interactions, the role of a monomer dimer versus you know, higher-order oligomers uh, within the neuron. And um, we now have this fascinating a new dimension in which ARC may be acting as a, as a vehicle to deliver RNA uh, to neighboring cells. But we don't know really the cargo. We don't know the cargo at this point. And um, there's an active search to identify you know, the RNAs and other cargoes that may be present uh, inside. So it's really difficult to speculate uh, you know, so much more at this point before we know the cargo and actually the recipient uh, cell types. So at the neuromuscular junction, we know that. In the brain, in the intact tissue, we don't know that yet. Um, and so in trying to, to, to round up to complete this uh, background story uh, of ARC, uh, I, I just wanted to, to, to point out that uh, we're also beginning to learn more and more about the post-translational modifications of ARC, which of course could be a, a critical, might be a critical determinant for switching the functional modality of the protein. So ARC is, is phosphorylated um, by, by ERK and also by DSK3. So the, the ERK phosphorylation is involved in the cytoplasmic localization of, of ARC. Um, the ARC protein is, is sumoylated uh, in, the, in the live animal during LTP. And that appears to, to function in coupling ARC to an actin cytoskeletal binding protein, Drebrin A. Um, and then a fair amount is known about the turnover, turnover of ARC. It's regulated by ubiquitination, um, and uh, it's also regulated by, late, by lysine uh, acetylation. And there is also a, a lipid anchor on ARC, and it's in this N-terminal domain, and it's just N-terminal to this, the ligamorization motif, the palmatorylation site, the cysteine cluster. So mutation of that does not affect the ligamorization of ARC that we've been, that we've been looking at. Um, so it's likely that, that both the palmatorylation and the charge effects of the basic, the basic nature of the NTD are important for the uh, plasma membrane interaction of ARC. Um, additionally, there's been a lot of interest in um, uh, ARC, in human ARC genetics. Um, and there's no time to go in, into details here. The single most important point would be that within the region of the ARC gene and um, several kilobases on either side, there really isn't uh, a lot to, to, to work with um, in terms of um, SNPs uh, linked to disorders. Um, the, it's, it, rather, it is the, the proteins uh, and effector partners of ARC uh, which tend to be enriched in loss of function mutations, rare, um, rare uh, SNPs and so forth. Um, that are of interest. So ARC itself seems to be protected, but it is certainly uh, the genetics do implicate ARC as, a, as a, a, a key participant, if you will, in the, in, in the risk for schizophrenia um, and autism. OK. So in the final few slides, I would just like to show uh, our, a progress that we've been making in putting ARC under optical control. Um, so we, we'd, like to, we'd like to be able to read out ARC's functional state. Um, but to do that, we need to know the structure of functional aspects of ARC uh, better than we do now. We have been doing such studies, but it's really hard to interpret them without uh, a better grip on it. Um, so uh, the focus has been on trying to put ARC uh, under the control of light. 
And this is the project of Honyu uh, Zhang in the lab. Um, and um, she is proposing that the, that, the, that the ARC protein competes with stargazin binding to PSD95 and in that way regulates the surface mobility of AMPA receptors. So that is how ARC is working. Um, and this is just a, a scheme of uh, uh, the uh, behavior of, of the, arc recept of the uh, AMPA receptors, a lateral diffusion of receptors in the membrane, exoendocytosis events, and then the diffusional trapping in which, uh, arc, uh, in which the AMPA receptor um, gets, uh, gets attached and, and, and docks then uh, to the, the postsynaptic membrane for interaction with the uh, glutamate released uh, from the active zone. Okay. So she is hypothesizing that ARC is competing um, with stargaze and for binding to PSD95. And uh, she's studying the surface mobility uh, by quantum dot tracking. So this is all in, in the work is carried out in, in, in hippocampal neuronal cultures. Um, and I won't go into, into exactly how that's done. Uh, right now, but she looks at the, the mobility of the particles uh, on the surface of the hippocampal neurons and dendrites. Um, so she started off by just taking, looking at the effects of surface mobility by expressing the whole arc protein or just expressing the end lobe. And either way, she sees an increase in surface mobility. Then if she takes a naive culture and knocks down arc, she sees a reduction in surface mobility. Um, in Worley's paper, they identified uh, two residues that, that are critical for stargaze and binding. One in the beta sheet groove, one in the hydrophobic binding pocket. So when Hon Yu expresses wild type arc and, it, and compares that to either of these mutants, she sees that that overexpression of the mutant does not lead to the increase in surface mobility uh, of the AMPA receptor. Then to try to, to put the, the, the arc end lobe uh, under optical control, um, we teamed up with Michael Lin. We had discussed with him back in 2012 the possibility of, of optical caging of arc, but we didn't know how to do it at that point. Um, really. How, how that was supposed to work. We didn't know the arc structure or anything. And then when, when Worley uh, published this hydrophobic binding pocket, we thought that we could tether uh, the, the, the domains of the reversible, photo, of the reversible photo switchable protein drompa on either side uh, of the end lobe to open and close it, and then by steric hindrance, block the entry of ligands into the binding pocket. So. Um, so Michael Lin, he had engineered a tetrameric uh, drompa to, a, to a, a dimer with uh, the right properties for this. So you would get the opening and closing. Um, and this is just a, a, a model of, of what it would look like at the bottom. Um, and so we, we made the recombinant forms of drompa and then did SACS analysis. So this is the actual SACS structures of what it uh, was drompa uh, surrounding the end lobe looks like in the open state, in the closed state. And when we express the, the open drompa, we get the increase in surface mobility. When we express the closed form, we don't get it. And then uh, finally, uh, Hon Yu would express the, 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 the end lobe uh, and the, the type that would allow the, the, the uh, photo activation and opening um, with uh, 400 and 91 nanometer light, and you can see then there's an increase uh, in surface mobility, um, uh, suggesting that the, that the arc end low, which we know is, is monomeric, uh, is regulating uh, the, the surface mobility of, of AMP receptors. What we now, like to, what, what we now are trying to determine is uh, the, whether there is a, a plastics change, a change in actual uh, synaptic strength to do the patch clamping and to look at, at the direction, is, it LTP, is there LTP or LTD? We don't know, although increase in surface mobility has been uh, shown by Daniel Choquet to be uh, critical for LTP. In the last slide there, could you just explain, um, so on the left and the right and the little pink swirly lines, are those, that's showing over time if you 
exposure to mobility of receptors? These are these are higher density of receptors per unit area as well. Right. Okay. So this is this is the, the, the tracking of individual particles, individual amperoreceptors. So each color represents the, the tracking of an individual particle. And then this is the, the uh, all of them together combined. So they're, 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 they're going, there's more movement, there's more fluidity. There's yeah. Not necessarily more receptors since if you took a snapshot per unit time for in the surface area at a higher density, or is there as well? There may, there, there, there very well may be an increase in the, in the number of amper receptors, and we're looking at this. And, uh, and we, we expect that, that there is a relationship between the mobility and the exoendocytosis process. So we're assay, assaying that as well, so we can, we can put this together. What we know so far is that there's an increase in the mobility. An increased mobility has been shown by, by the Cirque Lab to be critical for, for the LPP. But we need to know what is the actual effect on the physiology. We don't have that yet. Okay, so I'd just like to close with a, 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 a few perspectives um, that we have, what we've learned is that ARC is a, is a flexible protein, um, uh, one with extensive disorder. It has a compact structure, it has multiple ligands, not just within the N-lobe binding pocket, but there are other uh, protein interaction sites uh, on ARC, or for presinolin 1, for instance, calnexin, and others. Um, and that the protein has this striking homology uh, to the retroral gag domain. So it has some of the functional properties of the gag domains. Um, and um, it's also able to, to form these capsid-like structures, which, ra which really raises you know, many profound issues about the function and what's going on. So ARC is a, it's a signaling hub, and the monomeric end lobe is able to regulate the surface mobility of amperoreceptors, probably by regulating stargaze interaction with PSD95. And we're doing work now to really to specify whether it is actually that, that, that is the interaction that's key for this process. Um, the high order oligomerization and capsid formation is controlled by an N-terminal coil coil mo motif um, in an RNA responsive manner. So it appears that the ARC NTD it has, it has functional properties akin to the, both the matrix domain and the nucleocapsid domain from, from retroviral GAG. And then finally, uh, one can envision various uses, uh, uses for this information, so ARC-based tools for uh, optical switching of ARC activity state um, for the, the, re the um, reporting, making FRET biosensors uh, that could be used to, to visualize uh, in, for, in systems neuroscience when critical changes to, to ARC are, are taking place. So this would be a sort of a higher order process beyond NMD receptor activation or, or CREB activation or so forth, or looking at PKA and ERC signaling sensors. But to look at, at, at ARC, we think, would, would be uh, very useful in terms of trying to understand it, the, the computations that are taking place. And then uh, finally, um, there's also interest in, in, in using captures as vehicle for RNA delivery, as these are natural constituents, uh, uh, believed to be natural constituents of the body um, that could be useful in, for um, uh, for viral therapeutics, for, uh, excuse me, for uh, RNA therapeutics. Okay, so I mentioned the, the members of the lab on the way, and I'd like to thank my collaborators, particularly Aurora Martinez, Petri Kursula at the University of Bergen, Jose Maria Valpuesta from Madrid, uh, Meg Stratton at UMass Amherst, Michael Lin at Stanford, uh, Yasunori Hayashi at Kyoto for uh, collaborating on the, on the FLIM uh, fret work, and Jose Antonio Marquez, um, who was involved in the initial studies of ARC, of ARC structure. Um, okay, so thanks to the, to the funders, and thanks very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, the, evidence, the evidence from the fly um, doesn't suggest any, any particular element, but the three prime UTR. Yeah. 
Nothing that, nothing that has really come up so far. No. Right. Uh, what was the first question? Um, yes, it's uh, it's it's developmentally regulated. Um, yeah, so it, it uh, it's expressed really through, throughout life. So after post after post um, after embryonic day ten or so, one begins to see arc expression. But it's expressed throughout life, um, and there are uh, age-dependent uh, DNA. There's age-dependent DNA methylation, which uh, impairs the transcriptional, uh, impairs art transcription. But um, otherwise, not so much. Not so much is known. So, uh, so arc is is involved. Uh, it, it forms an endosome for trafficking these AMP receptors but also for, uh, for bringing in um, gamma secretase and, and APP. So it's involved in, in, in enhanced uh, uh, formation of, uh, of, of uh, beta amyloid, APP processing. Right. Um, so that, that's an, there's an aspect there and an age-related as, aspect there, you could say. And the second question was, uh, right, um, we didn't used to think so. <laughs> But uh, it, it, there's a, it's found in dendritic cells in the immune system. So the paper in Science Immunology a couple of years ago that surprisingly found that. And they compared it, they used a wild type and an ARC knockout. And it's interesting too that um, their work is implicating uh, ARC in the, in the cytoskeletal reorganization involving dendritic cell outgrowth in response to a LPS challenge. So mechanistically, it has some clear parallels to some of the plasticity work in, in, in actin regulation and so forth. Um, yeah, uh, that would be really the on, only evidence of, for really solid evidence for ARC outside of the nervous system. You can also see ARC in, in, in spermatids. It's really unknown. Um, the, the, ARC, the ARC mice are, are fertile. So that's a really, actually really old work uh, showing that. So it's really hard to know whether some of these, these brain, brain RNAs are often found um, in, the, uh, in these gametes and spermatids and so forth. It's not really sure why that happens. I wasn't clear. Are the capsids going retrogradually? Good question. <laughs> um, so uh, what's really surprising from the fly work is to see ARC in nerve terminals. To see it in the, in the motor neurons at all, but to see it in the nerve terminals, it's like, am I thinking, was, can this possibly be, be right? These people don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. But uh, the evidence is, is, uh, evidence is, is strong. So in that case, it, it, the ARC is, is, uh, em emanates from the, from the bouton and then transfers uh, to the muscle. And so all of, of the ARC that's in the muscle um, uh, that's involved in the plasticity derives from the, the bouton. So the, the, the capsid assembles in the bouton, it's released in the extracellular vesicle, and then so enters the, the muscle. Anterogradely, in that case, anterogradely. Whereas um, in, um, in, in the mammalian system, by work by in situ hybridization and actually many years of, uh, many years of work, uh, it's it's really clear and indisputable, uh, almost indisputable. I'm not ruling out a presynaptic origin, or not at all. Uh, but all the evidence is saying that when you stimulate a synapse, that you rapidly transcribe the arc in the postsynaptic neuron, and, and you can you can do single particle tracking on arc. You can look at the at the movements of the messenger RNA and so forth and study that. So it's clearly coming from a, from a postsynaptic source in that case, unless the, uh, so that, that we're missing something, that the in situs aren't sensitive enough, or uh, the antibodies aren't able to detect the presynaptic form, this is a possibility. Because one thing that's really curious is why haven't we seen these art capsules before? Right? So it's very exciting, but it's also very early days. Right? 
Uh, so a lot of 3, 3D AE and reconstruction has been done with seizures and, and uh, learning and memory and, and LTP and so forth. And uh, no, one is, no one has reported that there's an increase of these, of these, these structures of this size. You know. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, not, it's, it's not really known yet. So there's some pharmacology has been done to show that, it, that, that there's a endocytosis taking place. But the, the actual recognition uh, motifs are, have not been identified quite yet. So the question is, what is, is there, if there are um, you know, epi epitopes, if there are proteins on the, on the surface uh, of the extracellular vesicle, and that could be used to isolate specifically these vesicles and also to understand um, the, the, the recognition of the, um, of the target cells. So, it, uh, so in the, at the neuromuscular junction, fine. Muscle is a target, okay? That's good. Uh, in, the, in, in the hippocampus and in these cultural experiments, what's shown is that the, the, the recipient culture, the neurons, do receive ARC, right? So it, it definitely suggests that there's a neuron-to-neuron -neuron communication. But it hasn't been shown you know, in an intact embryo or in the intact brain that it happens. So that uh, will be really important to show going forward. Um, yeah, I know, I know some people who, are, who, who have been looking at that. A collaborator of mine has been, has been looking at it. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, so I see your question. Um, yeah, I don't really know. I don't really know. I can't really say. I don't really, I don't really know, anything more, know anything more about that, um, except that from this, from this work of my colleague, uh, Valerie Verge, at the University of Saskatoon in Saskatchewan, um, she does have evidence. It has, has, she's had posters on this where uh, the ARC messenger RNA is increasing and, and it's translated uh, in, these, in these axons from um, pr in peripheral neurons. So yeah, so there's actually will be inter interesting now to go and, and look more closely uh, at the presence of ARC at the neuromuscular junction and, and, and in butons. It's absolutely warranted. I wouldn't be surprised if people start to find, find something, given the, the evidence from the fly. But the fly is a long way. ARC has evolved twice. So the, the fly arc is very different. So, the, so the, uh, there are two, two arcs. Um, and uh, the fly arc doesn't have its end terminal domain. It has no domain. It has a little piece coming off. But it, it's, uh, yeah. So one of the things that we're interested in is whether this little piece is going to be is going to be enough to generate the capsid in the fly? Um, yeah, I don't think we should make you know we have this homology to the, to the, to the HIV, but um, there's a uh, there's a million there's a million million millions of years of evolution, right? So I think when we look at ARC, I don't think that that we should uh, try to um, be too strict. In our thinking, and, and, and it's going to parallel exactly what happens in any particular one of the retroviruses, because actually it's very diverse in how they use the, the matrix region, the nucleocapsid region, and so forth. And some of the viruses and nuclear entry is important for the for in, in the capsid formation process. Okay. Um, 
Well, uh, I, I can just com comment on it. I might not be able to, to answer answer this uh, fully. And perhaps we can we can talk about it afterwards. But um, so the uh, the mammalian arc uh, is in the um, tetrapod tetrapod line. Um, it's not found in, in fish, so you can you can see the the arc gene region with some of the retrotransposon elements, but there's no nothing that looks like the ARC protein. It doesn't have a, an ARC protein. So unfortunately, we can't study this in zebrafish. Um, yeah, and then there's a, a, a separate evolutionary line uh, where ARC has, has formed in, uh, in, in flies. Hmm. Right, right. The idea is that, is that there is a convergent, a convergent evolution, yeah. And then in flies too, there are different strains of the, of, of the flies that have uh, different genomic structures. And so it suggests there's a, there's a, a, a second evolutionary divergence within, within flies. Uh, it's, it's explained uh, in, the, in the Budnick paper. Okay, that's 